Vian, officially welcome to the Performance Formula podcast. Um, yeah. And and in particular, I firstly want to say congratulations. You know, you've just been selected ag- again for the national team, for South African national team yeah. to play a little yeah. bit of test cricket in the Caribbean. And currently, as we're recording this, you're over in the US playing the Major League, part of the San yeah. Francisco Unicorns, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. What what a life. It's been a it's been a cool journey. It's been a very cool journey. We've um I've been very blessed with the opportunities I've gotten over the last seven years as a professional, I'd say. So um yeah, I can't complain. I'm living a good life. Yeah, brilliant, man. I'm I mean, I I like having these conversations around performance, you know, with coaches, athletes, whoever is interested in joining me for a conversation. And so I think with you, right, the thing that interests me quite a lot is I remember seeing you playing for the first time, and you would most probably not even know this, right? I saw yeah. you playing for the first time, hearing about you a lot. Vian Mulder, there's this kid at St. Stidians, good cricketer, all-rounder, combatant bowl. And I remember seeing you for the first time when you were under 15, uh, playing in the regional under 15 trials week at St. Stidians yeah. there on the main oval. And I'm going to be perfectly honest. I watched you play and I thought, hmm, there's not nothing really exceptional about this kid, you know? And I, and I don't yeah. mean that in a bad way. It's like, I think for me, parts of your career, and I might be wrong for saying this, but parts of your career is sort of you fly under the radar quite a lot. Yeah. Yet, yeah. yet you do exceptional things. And I think it's sometimes not appreciated as much as it should be with you, you know? And I'm curious what your perspective on that is, you know? Like your struggles your challenges some people yeah. might say you're not bowling fast enough at times or you know you're yeah. batting you, you you tend to seem to be batting in positions that's not always best suited to you and yet yeah i've never heard you complain and yet i've never heard you you know it's like you just yeah. get on with it you know so yeah well i mean to answer your your point really i felt like that most of my career too to be honest mm-hmm. i felt like in many teams, in many environments, I've been like a nice to have, uh, mm. almost like a bit of a backup plan. Somebody who, who could potentially bat anywhere in the top six or seven, um, but generally felt full the role of six and seven. So you don't have a lot of responsibility batting with the tail. Um, you often have to come in and try and hit your first ball or your, in your first 10 balls, take a high risk option. And like you say, you fly under the radar quite a lot mm. because you don't necessarily always put in those massive performances like... For example, last night, Trickleton got 100 or 55 or 60 balls or something. They opened the batting and he got that opportunity to put in those performances. Um, so for most of my career with bat and ball, that's been that's been me. Mm. And it's been extremely frustrating, um, especially when I, when I started playing for the Lions back in 2016. Um, I kind of batted a seven and didn't really bowl. Um, any crucial overs, I bowled the easy overs. So to fly under the radar is quite easy. To keep your position in the team is quite easy. You'll always kind of have a role, um, but never have responsibility, which mm-hmm. I think in any anyone's career, responsibility is what brings um, a little bit of magic, but also big failures, I guess. Um, so the highs and lows are a lot higher and lower. And then I'd say over the last two years, well, the last three years, things have changed big time for me personally, where I've got more opportunity to take responsibility, to win games. And that all came from going moving to England. Well, not moving to England, but starting to play cricket in England, where I played for a smaller county in Leicestershire. And you kind of have to put in match-winning performances all the time because you're playing at a... I wouldn't call it a smaller county. Well, I will call it a smaller county. A, um, a county that doesn't have so many England players. So you kind of rely on every guy to pull, his, pull, your, pull your weight, pull your finger to be able to win games. And that taught me a lot about what I want as a cricketer, what it should feel like to win games and have that responsibility to win games. But more importantly, to enjoy it. Because I think before that, being a nice to have is not always great. You're never in the limelight, you're never playing, yeah, you're never putting in the big performances. So I definitely agree with what you were saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, and so I think the reason this interests me is because I've got parents listening in on the podcast. There's cricketers, there's athletes from other sports, right, that are, are <clears> listening <throat> in. And often we just look up to the Rickletons and the, I don't know, the yeah. Quinton de Cox of this world or the Steve Smiths. Yeah. or the, And we aspire to be like them, you know, yeah. be the superstar, be 
And hey, it's not like I'm saying you, you're not those things, right? To many people, you are a hero. But your journey, I think, exemplifies this idea that you don't necessarily have to be the big name out there or the hero, and yet you can still find your place, find your, your role and your responsibility and be successful at it and make a career out of it. And so I think there's a lot in your story to look up to and to try and understand yeah. a little bit more. If you could take me back to like those early days, right? When you were at school, when the world was, yeah. not, was not yet professional, what was, what was Bian's cricketing life like at that time? I think to take you back to where it started, obviously I played a lot of cricket in primary school, but I was in a little Afrikaans school in the West Rand in, in South Africa in an area called Florida. And you're like a big fish in a small pond there, so everything is great. But then my dad and them kind of said, in order for me to take the next step or have a chance to make a career out of this, I had to go to a decent high school. Um, and that was between Cares and Synstidians and ended up going with Synstidians where I went. Um, and things kind of progressed quite quickly there. I played under 14, 15, batted at three and four, sometimes opened the batting and, and did really well. And then I got an opportunity in grade nine, which I, when I was 15, to get an opportunity to play first team. And that's when I say my journey took off quite a bit. Um, and I started... Yeah, playing in a team that didn't that hardly ever lost. Um, so you kind of recognized all over by many people because you're never losing. You guys, you're always putting in performances as a team. Um, and that's where I kind of fell in love, I'd say, with cricket more than um, I did when I was younger. I just wanted to play rugby and cricket and anything with a ball. And then in high school, um, that's when and things changed, and I really started enjoying cricket for what for what it is as a game. Um, so yeah, I started playing f at 15, first team. I played South Africa in 19 at 16, and that's when I started believing I could make it as a professional, um, because that's when you, you know, wearing the green and gold for the first time, and you're with like-minded people, which was a really, yeah, the, the Saints was a big part of that. Um, playing with really good players at Saints as well. You're always exposed to people who make you better. Uh, I think that's the kind of recipe that Saints has that not many other schools do is they always have people who are playing South Africa 19 or whatever to kind of push the younger guys and set the bar really high. But that was my journey. I just loved playing sport. Um, it wasn't necessarily always cricket. It was rugby when it's rugby season, cricket when it's cricket season, but I just loved playing sport. And that's, I think, how I developed to be an all-rounder and be able to bat and bowl and be a decent fielder is just based on playing all sports and really enjoying what I'm doing. Schoolwork, I wish schoolwork meant more to me at school. But I was always pushed by by being as good as I can be on this on the sports field, and that was kind of my journey in high school, just really having fun and and then yeah, trying to be the best I can be. How serious was your preparation from a cricket point of view? Because you make it sound like it's all low key, right? As a but kid, what, yeah. As say, let's say through high school, they had Saints, right? I know, I know that environment and uh, to a certain yeah. extent. But, but you make it sound like it's all fun and games, right? But it, like, what was a, the typical week like if you had to think around cricket and your practice and your preparation? Was it sort of yeah. just, oh, well, okay, I'll just go hit some balls when I feel like it? Or, no. All right. So. No. So Ryan Rickleton lived at school. His dad was a teacher at the school. So, um, I mean, early in the mornings before school starts, we all go hit balls and then Pretty much as soon as school's done, we go hit balls again. And that's pretty much the recipe all week long in cricket season. And then in the winter, um, there's similar things that happen. But you're always hitting balls. I think that was our recipe or my recipe as a kid. Now I got a lot of confidence is by, I almost call it overtraining. But as a kid, I think you can just build your foundation so strong. Where like now I don't feel like I train as much as I used to as a kid. But my foundations are much stronger. But mm. A typical week is definitely before school hit balls, especially in those first three years of high school. And then schoolwork becomes a bit difficult, so you don't always have time to. Um, but generally, before school hit balls, after school hit balls, play games, pretty much three games a week, Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and, th and that was a big part of my development, was playing club cricket on a Sunday with the men. Um, from when I was 14, I played Premier League. Um, but you're always, like, just, you're always challenging yourself. There's a lot of work that goes into it at, at Saints, um, yeah. and that's why they, they produce such good cricketers. Yeah, so not a walk in the park, but sort of work no, no. done, right? But you're having fun what you're doing. That's an important thing. Yeah, so that's exactly what I was going to say. So <clears> my, my sense is, right, or my understanding would be you weren't forced to go hit the balls. No. 
right? It was no. something I want to do. I love doing. Let's go do this. Yeah. Yeah, but that's why a lot of people kind of fall away, especially at school. So that gap just keeps stretching um, because a lot of kids put in a lot more work at school than others do, which is mm. which is perfect. How it should be, right? Because if you want it, you should be training. If more other things are more important to you, then you need to do what is important to you at, at school in particular. Um, but if you want to become a professional, it's not, you just don't do what other kids do. So you say around the age of 19, if I heard you correct, you decided or you realized that you could make something of this? 17, I'd say. 17, um, 17. 17. Yeah, so I played in the 19 World Cup when I was 17. Um, okay. And that was leading it the year just before my matric year, but I ended up getting a rookie contract in my matric year to play for the Lions. Mm. Um, but I was going to study in Pretoria and I got an amateur contract there. Um, I was going to Pretoria to study, but because I didn't really believe yet that I could make it or I, I didn't understand the gap. Mm. And then when I, I went, to, went to Sri Lanka with under-19s, I captained the team and I got man of the series, or player of the series in the ODIs and the tests. And when I came back, we had this awards evening or whatever at the Lions and that's when it all changed. I got a rookie contract and that's when I kind of thought, okay, well, I can obviously make it now. I, I, I didn't even understand that that's how the system works. Mm. I just thought as a cricketer, you're going to the amateur system. As, as you know, the amateur is kind of, cricket is kind of their next step. And then you play there for a couple of years and you get a chance to go through unless you're like a Quinny or a KG. But I mean, no one really believes that until it happens. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. I, I remember that actually vaguely because in, in Gauteng, yeah. There at the Lions, there's huge things about good cricketers losing the, leaving the province at times. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And I, I yeah, remember I was there was a, leaving. yeah, there was a big thing around you staying or going. Those early years, right, in the Lions setup as a as a youngster, yeah, rookie, um, most probably big hopes, big dreams. What was that like? Who was in that change room that you were surrounded <clears> by that was maybe intimidating you a little bit, or? When I just started, there were guys like Hardis Fulun, Dwayne Pretorius, Rasi Van Adissen, KG, Demba Bavuma, Stephen Cook. So like really kind of set pros at the time. And they were really good people, to be honest, to get into the team. They accepted me for who I was. Um, and, and as a young kid coming from Saints, thinking of the bee's knees, it was, it was a, a journey that was like interesting for the first couple of years. You grow up so quickly enjoyed i really enjoyed my time at the lions and you always wanted to, to be better but the gap was quite big when i started i had a couple of good performances but you learn quickly that you've got a lot of skills to upskill basically mm. but it was a great environment to come into as a young guy um and they allowed me to just be me in many ways and they kind of a lot of the guys took me under their wing and wanted me to get better which i think is a good environment to be in for anyone mm. they allow you to be yourself and and as i grow grew up through the years, being in many different environments, that's something that I find vitally important for people to be free and be able to perform. Um, I struggled with that for, for many years. They just feel like you're not accepted, like you, they make you feel really small. And a big part of my career, if, if I look back, I wish I was harder in many ways in dealing with those things because my performance suffered big time. Um, and then you, the massive anxiety and all that stuff comes and it's stuff that in many situations I didn't have tools to deal with and be able to find a way to perform. It just overwhelmed me and I was pretty much useless, to be honest, for a big part of my I mean, but those are big words coming from you, you know, like being able to admit that and say, well, geez, I was actually not that great, right? I was not living yeah. up to my, I was not up to my potential. And interesting that the environment, mm -hmm. you know, played such a big part in that. Yeah, that sense everything. of belonging, that sense of knowing that, you know, you're accepted for who you are around a group of, around a group of um, players. So, yeah. Yeah. That's everything, to be honest. Mm. I think as a, as a, as a sports person, you get the obviously a different personalities and some people can really perform under that, those pressures where I can't mm. for many, many times, like I said earlier in my, in my career, there's so, there was so, I mean, it frustrates me, like you won't believe to speak about this, but there were so many situations where I think if I could control what was going up on upstairs, um, could have looked a lot differently and I wouldn't be kind of in a lot the position I am, I was in for so long. Um, but yeah, we, we can dive into that a bit longer. Yeah. A bit later, well, I, I, you know, I was just about to say, is there like a specific example that you're, that you're happy to share, you know? So well, I think that the, the the big thing is how your senior players make you feel. Mm. Um, 
so I won't like dive into where it was or whatever the case may be, but the, the, how they make you feel, um, if what you bring to the team is good enough. Um, and that was a, that was the environments that I really struggled in where you're kind of always looking over your shoulder and you're thinking like, what is this guy thinking? What is this guy thinking? Where do I fit in? You know, just by being me. And many times you can't find those answers. And that's when I think performance suffers big time because your your future, your anxiety or what you're thinking is going to happen in the future just over, overwhelms um, everything. And everything goes blurry and is like, oh, you lose all batsmanship and all like your cricket skills. I personally did. Um, and being in, in this environment, working with Shane Watson a little bit, um, a massive part of his career was a similar thing. Mm-hmm. I and mean, he... He worked so hard with a guy called Jacques Dallet to to be able to find a method and and deal with that that stuff. And sometimes in your career, you kind of think think things pass your path for a reason and at the right time. So it was really cool to work with him um, over the last two weeks or so. Yeah. So the the cool thing is I've had Jacques on my podcast. <laughs> yeah. A couple a cool of guy. A, yeah, a couple of episodes ago and. What an awesome, phenomenal human being that keeps performance very simple in my mind. Yeah. And I think a lot of what I think and understand about performance is it comes from, in a huge part, the conversation I had with him and researching his work quite extensively. Yeah. So I researched a lot of his work and then I was like, okay, hang on, I need to try and get this guy on my podcast. Yeah. Um, which I, Incredible, which, man. Yeah, which he, which he did. And if anybody asks me about which podcast they must listen to, I normally go, go listen to the Jock Dallaire one if you want to know yeah. about performance, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's brilliant. As you were talking there about the future and the anxiety, like straight away, he's, his sort of voice popped into my head. Um, okay. Many cricketers struggle with this type of stuff, right? They struggle with trying to find their best. They struggle with knowing maybe that they've got more in them and they just like under the radar, nobody sees them or they're in a team, but they don't really know why they're there. They can bat a bit, they can bowl a bit. Maybe they can just bat, maybe they can just bowl, but they're sort of the fifth sort of option rather than being the main option. What what has been the most significant sort of things that shifted that for you? Because I look at sort of what you achieved, say, in the last SA20, right? Winning games at the back end of innings, getting 50s off like not a lot of balls. What are some of the major things that shifted for you to understand okay, cool, this is who I am, this is what I do, this is the value I, I can bring to a team. You know, let me claim a little bit of that limelight for myself. And I think you'll ever be the arrogant cricketer, right? That's never been my yeah. sort of sense about you. But everybody wants their moments, right? Everybody wants to yeah. stand in the sun a little bit. Yeah, what's the most significant things? Well, to be honest with you, I think it's all kind of coincidence in a way, how it's unfolded over the last year or so. Obviously, it's been years of hard work and like really wanting it to go well. I mean, that's, but my time at at Leicester gave me a lot of belief in myself in many, to put it simply, to be able to put in those big performances. But in the SA20, it was a situation I was really backed for, I wouldn't say the first time, but I was really backed in a specific role with a lot of responsibility. And that's where you actually notice when I win a game where before, I never really had that opportunity um, in South Africa to be able to win those games, batting at five or whatever the case may be in T20s. I mean, kind of playing a role where you protect class because um, that was that was it, really. Uh, I'd bat in the power play. If we lose three early wickets, I'd go in um, and I'd have 14 overs to bat. You know what I mean? You can make something happen with that. If we don't lose early wickets in the power play, I bat six just after class. Um, so I'm all, you're always kind of going with the momentum of the game. So you can just play and give yourself the best chance in many situations because you have time. Where before, um, I haven't really had that chance at home. Where at Leicester, I did. So it was kind of things coming together in many ways. But the important thing is I was backed by Lance and the coaching staff there to to actually have a big impact on the game and give have an opportunity to have an impact on the game and not worry about if I fail and I'm done. Even though... I think if I failed in my third game in the SA20, that would have probably been my last game in the SA20. So, like I said, things kind of fell into place. And since then, I've had a really good year. Going back to the Lions, I won many games for the Lions this year consistently. Um, and it's it's kind of got me to be more recognized. Um, I've got an opportunity to play in the MLC. I played a couple of T20s for South Africa. 
against West Indies. But in the end, it's been a, a situation, a journey where with a little bit more responsibility, I've made things happen at different stages of my career. Mm. And finally, where I'm at now, hopefully things are falling a bit more into place. Yeah, and I think it's brilliant, right? I think it's brilliant that the good guys, if, if I can call it that, right? Somebody like you, where you just do the work, you get on with life, you get on with business, you work not just on your skills, but on yourself, that eventually yeah. things start turning. And I mean, I, I really wish that that continues for you, right? Thank you. Because uh, sometimes we speak these words and the mother cricket has a way to take care of us, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think that what you said there is, is like really important for me. Like through all of this, I've had to understand that cricket is going to end somewhere. Mm. I mean, we all want to play really well, but it's not, I just hold the spot temporarily. Mm. And that's, that's just being realistic about it. So at some stage, am I going to enjoy what I'm doing and actually try and win a game or you know, be able to take risks or... Am I going to ever look over my shoulder? You know what I mean? And, mm. and be the nice guy or nice to have in a team. And sometimes you have to make those bold decisions. I think if I had anything I'd give to my younger self, any advice I'd give to my younger self, is not be afraid to take chances and be able to take full accountability for what you're doing, mm. but not be afraid to mess it up. I think that's great advice, right? Yeah, yeah. Because I think yeah. when we're young, we at times think it's the end of the world if we fail today. Yeah. Versus, it's I, actually not. <laughs> I felt like that for years. Yeah, for yeah, years. yeah, yeah. And I was. I'm one of the lucky ones who got an opportunity at a young age. Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows, right? Who knows? So take me, if if it's okay with you, right? Take me through a little bit. Like, what would a typical preparation be like for you at this point in time? <clears throat> If you know you've yeah. got a, a practice session today, what do you yeah. do? How do you start your day building into that? You know, as much detail as you can, if it's okay with you, you know? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So I think I'm, uh, over the last year, I've learned a lot about what preparation works a bit better for me mm -hmm. and what doesn't. Sorry, just so, what age are you now? <laughs> I'm 26. Right. So at the age of 26, 26. you're still learning about what preparation works. <laughs> I mean, I, this, this whole SMLC, I've been working with um, Shane Watson and Ben Rora is his name. They're the two batting coaches, I'd say. And I'm like basically learning how to bat again. It's like you just keep learning all the time. And that's, the, that's why I keep coming back. I think if I stopped learning, I don't know how much I'd be able to still keep giving, if that makes sense. Because yeah. that's the exciting. That's why I get up in the morning. I want to go and get better. Um, mm. If I don't feel like I'm getting better, I'm wasting my time. And that leads into my preparation. Yeah. I think where before I just hit thousands of balls, just keep hitting balls, but never have much purpose in what I'm doing. Or mm. you hit a thousand cover drives, you know, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm getting better when I'm in the middle. Mm. And that's been the big preparation part for me is how do I not just prepare by hitting balls, but how do I prepare what's going on, on upstairs? And that's where a lot of research has come in for me. Look at what you're going to face the next day or the next game. This is purely preparation for that game. It's not actually practice to get better. It's preparation for the game. Um, so, say, for example, we play against the LA team. You have Spencer Johnson, Josh Little, Cornet Dry, Sanyal Narayan, for example. So, there's two left-handers in there. There's Sanyal Narayan, who's a mystery spinner, and Cornet Dry is a normal right-hand right -hand seamer. They all got relatively good pace. I have to be sharp, so I make sure I get into good positions from before the ball's released in my preparation. Make sure my shoulders dip, my hands are nice and high so I can access any ball. And then... I literally just cover what they try and bowl. Spencer Johnson tries and Josh Little try to swing the ball back into me early on. I coordinate drive, try to swing the ball away from me and Sanyal Narayan doesn't miss the stumps. So I make sure I get in my preparation what I'm going to face in. So I got those bases covered. Yeah. And for me, it's all about head position and head position, shoulder position. Um, I'm not like a massive feet mover in terms of big trigger movements, that type of thing. But in all of those balls that they bowl me, those two keys, head position, shoulder position, have to be in place so that when I go into the game tomorrow, I know my positions are good enough and I can just react. Because um, I've always been somebody that overdoes the conscious mind. So I think way too much about what's coming up and not don't react enough. And when I've played at my best, I just react. Yeah. But I still have technical cues that are very important. And those are the things that I prepare. And it's the same thing with bowling. A um, couple of technical cues, running in nice and tall, use my arms nice, use my arms as much as I can. And then before all of that happens, top of my mark, what am I going to bowl to the batters tomorrow? And I mean, I, we went to a baseball game this week. And I mean, baseball for me is like, that would be the ultimate 
I call it scouting on what the batter does or the pitcher does. And you're going to have to prepare for that. And that's what's coming at you um, all the time. So that that's how I try and do it. I can't try and keep it as simple as I can. And watching someone like A.B. De Villiers, Heinrich Klaas and prepare, they prepare so well in the way they, for how the, the way they want to. And, and that's how I try and do it as well. Um, learning from them and learning from my past experiences when it went well and when it went badly. That's kind of my little recipe and what I found works for me. So the, the type of preparation you would do to get better, right? What's, yeah. the, what's the difference between that and more what you describe, say, there as a performance preparation? You know? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a big difference um, in, in purely the way I go about it. So you just hit a little bit more like, say, throw, normal throws. For example, I'm working on my shoulder position at the moment. Uh, where I'm trying to get technically better. My shoulder and my hand, so they don't separate. So the, the best way I can explain that is is actually getting the shoulder dip in, but not getting my hands separate from the shoulder dip. So they're almost in sync and like almost like a slow movement up, getting this in place, because from here I can play any shot. So that's kind of my, how I see about it. So how that would go is, once again, go back to hitting a lot of balls, firstly, and repetition on that specific movement. So I'm not too worried about what length is bowling or that type of thing. But it's more getting into that position every ball and getting feedback every ball on that position from someone else. Um, and then I'd mix that up with facing bowlers, actually challenging myself in the nets to getting the technical cues in place, but also be able to react so that when I get into day before where it's just preparation for the game, I know I'm in, in good positions and I'm not in the right place. But it just goes back to a lot more repetition and being very specific about what I'm trying to achieve in practice. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's a bit of a difference in reps, definitely. Feedback is another one from other people that changes when I go from a technical session to actually being able to prepare. Yeah. So you, I think you described beautifully what I call the distinctions I make is between like a technical mind, you access a technical mind, or you access a yeah. performance mind. And both are essential, but, but they shouldn't be overlapping. What I mean by that no. is if you had to go into a game with like a technical mind approach, where you're worried about where your shoulders are and where your hands are, then you must probably not going to perform. The, the yeah, you're not that reacting. Happened. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I've been in that situation many times where you actually, you, know, you go into the game and you're thinking about so many things. You don't actually focus on the ball and like maybe one or two cues. Because I think cues are important because they give you straight feedback about where you are. It also brings you to the present. Mm. It's like, am I, what, what, what am I doing here? What am I feeling? Where when you're in the game, you want to have one or two cues, but completely focus on the ball and react to what's coming at you. Yeah. But in practice, there's no consequence, man. So you can... I mean, I can focus on many different things and realize by the third ball that I miss hit that, okay, I'm just focused on this. I'm not actually watching the ball. Mm. And then that loop kind of carries on. So it always comes back to just focusing on the ball, as yeah. simple as it is. But slowing down the speed gives you an opportunity to work on something technical and completely focus on the technical side of it. Yeah. But when it's at max speed, if you think technical, you're just going to get it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I and I appreciate that you make that distinction right in in such a clear way, <clears throat> and I like especially the thing you highlight around specificity that it's very specific. So even your performance preparation is specific to the next performance, yeah, and your technical preparation is specific to some technical component that you want to get better at. Yeah. Having said that, if youngsters are listening to this, I don't think the volume work is a bad thing when you're younger. No, volume so the, is everything. Yeah. So when you have technical sessions, volume is everything. I mean, that that goes for everyone. When, I, when you have a month off, you hit a lot more balls than when you do during the season. That's mm. just as simple as that because you don't have time to work on technical things during the season because you're mm. playing so many games. But volume, as a, as, as a kid, volume is what gave me my foundation. I wish I, wish I actually took the time to understand a bit more what I was doing mm. and not just letting it happen, if that makes sense. Oh. For example, I've, I've always had a bit of a technical deficiency where my front foot goes across to, mm. so if it starts on leg stump, it goes to off stump. If it starts on off stump, it goes a bit further across. Mm. And that's purely got to do with my head position and my shoulder position. So my shoulder position stay very flat. It's mm. very difficult for you to be able to get into that position where you're dipping your front shoulder mm. and hands go up where, and your, your weight is almost like further back. Where in this position, your head's always going almost towards the stumps on the other side. Mm. And that allows everything to stay in line. But I didn't quite understand what I was doing. I was just hitting balls, many cover drives. And in the nets, 
you know, it works out. But as soon as your intensity goes up and your anxiety goes a little bit up or whatever you want to call it, nerves, your body reacts funny in a funny way. And that's where those technical cues are so important. Yeah. 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 I, I like that because I normally say in performance mind, you're allowed like one. Allowed is maybe, it's not my job to give people permission, but I encourage people to say like, you have maybe say one at most two. And that's essentially what you're saying too. You know, like technical cues in performance. And they would normally yeah. be something that you can control ahead of time yeah so, so it's not a thing as, as it comes that you're trying to think of some technical cue it's something you can check pre-ball release essentially yeah exactly yeah. yeah exactly okay what do you do in the game so if it, like i remember and i don't know i can't remember exactly which game this was right but i remember you got a 50 or 30 ball something like that in the sa20 i don't know if it was the semi-final i'm not too sure yeah like if you could walk me through that game, right? Maybe in, in the actual performance, like what's going through your head? What are you doing there in the dugout before you get out as you walk onto the field Yeah. while you're having to face these bowlers? Like what are you busy with? So, I mean, you always get like a bit of a feel. And I think that's been my biggest development over the, the last year or so is being being able to deal a little bit more with a lot of the mental stuff. And so that's I think it comes with failing a lot, to be honest. Mm. You kind of let go a little bit and... I, I struggle as soon as I play well again, then I, the anxiety and stuff gets worse um, because I don't have the, I haven't had the tools for so long to deal with it. But before, like sitting on the side, watching, watching the game, I always try and get some cues of what the bowler is trying to do. Um, what the wicket is trying, what, what the wicket is doing. Is it a bit sticky? Is it skidding on bouncing? Um, is it staying a bit low? So you get all those feedbacks, that feedback, and that gives you different options, I feel. So what shots I should look for, what the bowler is predominantly going to try and bowl. And that gives me feedback the whole time of when I go out there, where should it be easier to score and where should it be harder to score? Sometimes you walk out there and what you assess on the side is not exactly the same, but the important thing is you have some form of information going into, into like a playing in the middle. Point. Like a starting point. you got something. Yeah, yeah. you got something. And also who's coming up to bowl because that makes a big difference in when you take risks with matchups and all that stuff. But yeah, I keep, try and keep that as simple as I can, but as clear as I can. Um, and that also takes me out of my own head a little bit. But once you've got that information, the longer you sit, the more nonsense happens upstairs and the more you have to kind of just try and channel it a little bit. But as soon as I go out to play, my technical cues are always there. I've had a back and across trigger movement. So I get my trigger movement in play and then it's by keeping my head as still as I can. And as soon as my head is still, I almost feel like there's a split second where everything stands still. I don't know if that makes any sense. Where everything is still, then the ball's released and then I react completely. And with all the information I've taken in before, you kind of have your options and you're looking in specific areas already. You don't have to think about that again. It just happened. Um, and that's when you can react at your best. But Going out to the middle, it's always game situation for me. What does the games require from me in order for us to win? Who I'm batting with, if I'm batting with Clarsen, for example, it's about always getting him on strike. Don't take too much risk. He's the best batter in the world for a reason. So get him on strike, let him run the show and you kind of play second fiddle for as long as you kind of need to until it's your catch up and do your match up and you can catch up so quickly. He always says to me, you're two shots away from a really good striker if you're batting a runner ball. So that's, that's how I kind of look at it. And when it's my time to take pressure off him, then I am the one that has to take risks. So it's always about game situation for me um, and what the game requires and with my one or two technical cues. Okay, so, so I want to maybe just put some of my own words to what you said, right? So, and maybe just structure it a little bit. So what I'm hearing, right, is that before the time you, you generate like an awareness of conditions, right? Yeah, uh, definitely. And, <clears throat> and maybe checking in with what you did the day before in terms of where the bowlers are bowling and sort of like, are, are those things still on track, right? Or yeah. is, is Spencer Johnson bowling what we thought he was going to bowl? Kind of like that's yeah. sort of the sense I'm getting. So it's like a check-in with your preparation as well as creating an awareness of the actual conditions. So where would it be yeah. easy? Where would it be difficult to score? Then when yeah. you walk out to bat, you have your technical cues, so your trigger movement and your shoulder and your hands, I'm assuming, and then what you do is you don't consciously think too much about where you're going to hit the ball because you already have that awareness built in from what you did before the time just when you were sort yeah. of thinking about the conditions. So that's the part I find interesting that, that might be different in you, right? And I'm not so get, this is not saying it's right or it's wrong because I think, not I think, for me, 
each athlete has their own unique way of being at their best. And it's about understanding what you are at your best. And it might be different to others. What I do find a lot of cricketers do, batters do, is when they're out on the wicket, they would have what I call like give themselves like little micro instructions. So it's almost like, yeah. okay, the off spinners come on. Okay, off spinner, I'm going cow. My, my, my sixth option is at cow. My, uh, there's a single to long off and long on. And if, if anything is short, I'm hitting it. I'm getting across and I'm hitting it, you know, past square leg, something like that. Yeah. So there's like this yeah. constant interplay of their inner dialogue where they're almost like instructing themselves as to what to do. Now, I know, I'm not sure yeah. if you do that. In your yeah. description, you didn't necessarily <clears throat> explain it like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think you're always looking. Um, so you always, so for me personally, it's like, you always know where your boundary options are. So um, I always know if he pitches it up, you can pretty much hit a long on to cow. If he goes short, you can hit it over long on cow. If he gives me width, I'm going to hit him over cover or whatever the case may be. But uh, the more I think about like consciously thinking, if he bowls a full ball, I'm going to hit him there. The more I become like really one dimensional and I don't react to what he's delivering. I try and hit that ball there no matter what, mm. because that's what I'm, con that's what I'm thinking about. If it, I need to hit him over long on, that's my sixth option. So when, no matter where he bowls, if I'm under pressure, I'm going to try and hit him over long on. Does that make sense? I, yeah. don't, I don't access all my areas. That's yeah. how I feel about it. So yeah. I try not to overdo. This is what I'm going to do against every ball. It's more <laughs> react to what I'm feeling and what I'm seeing. And your, your positions you get into, you should be able to access many different options. So yeah. it shouldn't be limited to only hitting one ball over cow, if that makes sense. And that's yeah. why I try and rely more on my instincts to take over with the conscious mind and being the research, knowing that the easier option is to hit Narayan's off spinner and not his, his uh, knuckleball or his dusra. Mm. So naturally, you kind of react to what you see and mm. what you've done, all the research you've done before. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love that, right? I, like the, the last little bit of this conversation to me is so important. So I'm hoping that people who listen in have listened to you, right? Because I think you're explaining the idea of what batting is in my mind, right? That you've, you set up in a way that allows you to score all around the ground. And I call yeah. it, you don't, you don't have a one track mind. That's what you sort of explained. Like I'm only going to hit the next ball goes over long on, right? Then yeah. you, then you screwed. So I normally explain like to have at least a three track mind. I uh, yes. use the game Subway Surfer as my example, right, to explain that. I'm curious, do you create more options than that? If you if you talk about, like, all your options, do you, do you go, like, okay, I can go third man, yeah, cover there, or do you sort of also limit that down at times against specific bowlers in specific conditions to say, okay, against this bowler, I'm going here, here, and here, or is there more? Yeah, is... yeah I, think, I think in many ways there is more to it, but, I mean, if you can keep it to three, I guess you, you'd probably be one of the best in the world, to be honest. Yeah, you can hit three different balls for six. Not many bowlers have more options than that. Um, yeah. T20 bowlers are really smart and they've learned to bluff. And in many different ways, a field will say this, but they still sometimes bowl something else. So that's where, for me, it's so important to clear in my head to what he delivers, have my best option for what he delivers, not necessarily look for specific things. So obviously... If he's trying to bowl Yorkers, it's quite clear of what I'm going to try and do. I'm, I might try and lap him. Or if I, it's somebody that I feel misses a lot of his Yorkers, you just stand and wait for him to miss. And then you kind of hit the ball based on the line. But because of my strong position, I can hit the ball in different lines, mm. if, that makes, make, yeah, if yeah. that makes any sense. So yeah. in theory, you do have the three-track mind where you know if it's outside off, it goes over long off. If it's on the stumps, it goes long on. And if it's missing leg stump it goes cow for example so yeah. i mean there is your three your three track mind i guess yeah. yeah so there is three there is different options but for me i never want to limit myself to a specific area i okay. have to be able to access all around the ground because that's when i'm at my best and when mm. i'm actually giving myself the chance to use what i have not just be one dimensional and that's some, a big thing i worked with ashim amla over this last season is if a guy's bowling wider to me not to still try and hit him to the leg side because the short boundary is on the leg side does mm. that make sense mm. still access the offside because that's where i'm strong use my hands to be able to hit the ball over point hit the ball over cover use my hands to hit it over third man mm. because those are all options that give you the same as walking across and trying to slog him over cow um if that makes sense so yeah. it's all about it's always about just having yeah, being clear and giving my best my, my chance the best myself the best chance to execute what he's bowling um, to the best of my ability. Yeah. That's a, like, I think that, yeah, 
I love that example. So taking <laughs> on the game still in your strengths, you know. Yeah, that's walking, always in my strengths. Yeah, yeah, always into your strength. Yeah. So even if it's the bigger always. side of the field, you back yourself to hit it over extra cover yeah. into that gap behind there rather than, yeah. okay, short boundary, let me let me take that on. Yeah. I, think I most... mean, if you watch, sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, no. If you watch Andre Russell, how many times have you ever seen Andre Russell try and lap the ball? Never. He never laps. Klaassen, he laps when he's at, at his last resort. Andre Russell doesn't even lap if it's his last resort. Mm. We played against him this week. We had fine, no fine leg, no third man. Mm. And he still hit, hit the ball over long and long for six. Mm. He had no interest in lapping because that's not his strengths. Mm. And that's the, that for me has, has been very important in my learning over the last year and a half, two years has been, what are my strengths? <laughs> you know, we all think we're able to village and we can hit everywhere. But realistically, what are my strengths and where do I, where do I find it easier to score no matter what length or a line you bowl? And that's, that's when I've been at my best is when it's completely clear upstairs and I'm not thinking too much about what he's doing, more trying to understand what mm. he's doing, but then reacting to what my strengths are. Yeah. If we had to put the shoe on the other foot, right, from a bowling point of view, how is what yeah. you're doing different? Same. So I'm, I'm quite a good Yorker bowler. That's been my, one of my, when I'm under pressure, I go for my Yorker and I, I, I kind of, back that ball at, at my best that is my best ball so i've been working on slower balls and using the bouncer more because i've picked up a little bit of pace so mm. i can i can bowl the bouncer a bit more often and maybe why yorker that type of thing but when under pressure the only ball that you fully backed is the one that back that is the one that you believe is your strengths mm. um so that's 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 been a massive learning for me in t20 bowling in particular is when your gut feel says something and you go, but my previous length ball worked. Why don't I go length ball again? But my gut feels say to me, go Yorker. Mm. That's something I've had to tap in big time because that's your instinct. That's what that's what comes almost naturally to you in that moment is that I need to win this ball and Yorker is my best ball. So I go for my Yorker. Mm. So it's the same thing. Always sticking to your strengths. Um, mm. I mean, if you watch someone like in Red Bull cricket, like Jimmy Anderson bowl, you know what's coming at you. Good away mm. swinger, wobble seam, it might nip back. And maybe an inner, but he always bowls. His stock ball stays the same for ninety percent of the time because that's the mm. one that he backs most, and that's his strength. So I think bowling is even more simple than mm. batting because I mean you're in control of where the ball goes in many ways. So if you're clear in what you're trying to achieve, more often than not you you execute. Where if you have that doubt, that's when you get me. Yeah, you're standing at the top of your mark. What you're basically explaining is you're standing at the top of your mark, you're bowling the last over or you're at the back end of the innings there. You've got Dre Russ standing at the other end. Yeah. You you got to back your strength, right? You've got to set a field for that, run up and back that strength. And if you miss, you know you're in trouble, basically. Yeah. And that costs you the game. But you're not sort of, what I'm hearing is you're not going to try and do something now all of a sudden that's not yeah. within the scope of how you understand your game and your bowling basically yeah and i think the mindset's everything there because it doesn't really matter what you bowl i mean in many ways if you muhammad irfan and you seven foot tall your best ball is probably length mm. because of the bounce you get it's hard to hit but if you're at the top of your mark and you're thinking i'm bowling to under russell if i get it wrong yeah you know the coach is going to say this guy can't deal with pressure it's going to cost us the game i'm going to mm. cost us the game i don't know how i'm going to deliver this ball I haven't even thought about what I'm bowling yet. Mm. I haven't, there's no process. And that's, I mean, I've done that for so many years. And that's why I've been crap for so many years in different situations, to be honest. Because you're so worried about what's happening in the future or the outcome or what happened. This guy hit me in the past. What if he hits me again? You know, there's, I mean, that's natural. And if, if anyone thinks that's not natural or that doesn't happen to everyone, I think you're a bit delusional, to be honest, because that. 100% what happens to any sports person in many different situations. And that's why you have off days. That's why there's days where you you feel like you're on top of the world is when you have those things in sync. And you're like, okay, I'm in control of my space here. It doesn't really matter who I bowl to. This is my best ball. That's probably when you have your best day. But understanding that it's not so much about what you bowl. It's more about completely being inst instinctive and committed to what you're going to bowl. Because... If you're following your gut feel, more often than not, that's the right option. And you will probably execute it a bit better than when you're hoping that your captain runs from it off and tells you what to bowl. Um, yeah. So for me, that sums up 
the guys who do it really well and the guys who do it averagely is yeah. how they deal with the mind. Yeah, it's so enlightening for me to hear you speak, right? I mean, I, I think it, it can often be perceived that I have this podcast, I'm a mental coach, and it can often be perceived that I do this, say, to get clients or, you know, whatever. I do these conversations because I love having them, right? And I think sort of raised so many freaking cool things here that I hope that people that listen to this can take little bits here and there, right? It shows <laughs> their mindset. I remember I was having a chat at a coffee shop a few years ago. Right? And you were considering yeah. working with me yeah. and you didn't, right? And I didn't initially think any, it, it wasn't like we started this relationship and we started walking a journey, but there's a part of me, I mean, I'm sitting here and I'm having goosebumps, right? And I remember some of the stuff we spoke about there and I'm sitting here and I'm so appreciative of the fact that you found someone or you found some way to figure it out, right? Because yeah. a lot of what you said is most probably the things I would have, in my mind, I would have taught you. Right. And that's not to blow my own horn. It's basically just to say, like, there's always a way for people to figure out the game. Right. And you find yeah. your people and you find the, you find your way through it. Right. So a lot of these, I think, realizations and things you speak about the anxiety, the future, worrying about the outcome. You speak about having a process, being clear. Like, that's my jam. Right. That's like so up my alley. And I'm I'm so looking forward to the rest of your career, you know, and how how you keep growing and how you keep evolving and how you keep shifting your own bars. You, you find a little bit more, even more of the roles and responsibilities that really suit you because it's, a, it's been wonderful mm -hmm. to watch your journey. You know, like I said, yeah. first time you were 15 years old, then I've had a couple of interactions with you and to sort of see where you are at this point in time and what you're doing and what you're achieving. I wish you nothing but the best, right? I wish you Thank every, you so every success and, and thanks for your willingness to come on here and share openly, you know, no, it's an some, of, pleasure. some of your struggles give us a little bit of insight on what happens behind the scenes when you practice and when you play yeah to be honest with you it's been it's been a, a journey where you kind of look at the good players and you think you're so far off and you know you've kind of missed the boat and and all that type of stuff but i mean if you look at class and he's 33 for the last two and a half three years he's been unbelievable that mm -hmm. means i've got four years until i kind of have to potentially figure it out you know he was unbelievable before then but it's all about i think not giving up right mm. and and in the end it's like you're going to make mistakes and you're going to be weak and you're going to be um struggle you're going to struggle many times and you're going to but for me as long as i'm trying my best all the time and i'm trying to get better i think i'm on the right track and yeah. in the end if i if maybe if it's not about cricket then that's also okay mm. you know i can do something else but at some stage you kind of have to try and put the process in place. And I mean, to come back to, we had that coffee at the coffee shop and we never ended up doing any work together. I've had that with six, seven different people. Um, mm. I've never been able to make myself vulnerable enough to be able to deal with that. Mm. And that's only been over the last two years, I guess, I'd say when I was wanting to quit cricket and I said, this is not for me. I can't deal with this stuff anymore. We actually put the work in, I guess, to try and get get it mm. better and and learn more from it. It's it's a situation where I think when you're ready, things kind of yep. fall into place and it happens for the right reasons, yeah. and you're actually willing to learn. Yeah. Before it was all I failed a little bit, maybe I must try it, which is yeah. not. I don't think that reason is strong enough. Mm. Um, so it's nothing against you or any of the uh, other people. I, I the take important no thing is, yeah, yeah. I think the important thing out of that all is that some stage you're going to have to make the decision yourself and do it yeah. for you. Yeah, I think, and, and I think that's such a cool thing, right? Because it can easily seem, I mean, we're all trying to live a life, right? We're all trying to move ahead. Like you pursuing a cricket career. I'm sure if you didn't get paid for it, you might've been doing something different, right? And so yeah. I think at times it can seem like we're, we're in things just for the money or in, in it just for, say, the benefit we can get from it, Right. But the, I think the important thing in what you just expressed is that you were always seeking, right? And so even, even if you felt like Jody wasn't the fit at the time, for whatever reason, maybe it was just because I'm not the fit. Maybe it's because you weren't ready, right? Yeah. <laughs> it, it doesn't really matter for me that much. I'm just appreciative of the fact that you found a way, right? You found a way to figure it out. And hey, well, you must, I'm trying to figure it out. I was just about to say that you must probably haven't got it all figured out, but you consistently no, no figured it out. <laughs> you no consistently in, figuring it out, you know? Yeah. And I don't know if we will exactly. ever figure it out. I don't know if no. we'll ever figure it out. But the, And that's the point, right? That's the point is that we've got to keep 
figuring it out, keep getting better. And who knows, you might never become the class and I hope you do, right? Or, but, but your okay journey, yeah, but your journey won't have any regrets. And I think that's the more important thing, right? Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Vian, I've Thank loved you. this thing. I've absolutely Thank loved you, this. It's really cool. Yeah, thanks for your time. I know you're a busy guy, and um, no, no, it's, not, it's not always not always easy getting professionals while they're on tour and things like that. So I, no, I'm I, glad we managed to to mix schedules and actually sort it out. That was cool. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You. No, cool. thank you. Chat to you soon. Right. Um, maybe just before you go, um, can you yeah. send me a couple of photos that I'm allowed to use? I don't want to use things and sort of get in trouble. Um, you know, I know, I don't know sure, if you I have do. any image rights contracts and things like that. You know, I don't want to, I'm not like if you, if, and, and it's better if you send it to me, because then I can at least say, no, Vian sent me this photo. If, if there, there's never been, you know, but I just want to make sure that I cover myself that end. Sure. Um, are you looking for like active photos? Whatever. If you give me a couple Cricket of options. Photo? Yeah, give me a couple cool. of options. I mean, I don't think okay. there's a huge problem in using a Sunrisers photo or something like that, you know, because that okay. stuff gets posted on social media all the time. I don't think I, it's an issue at all. But if there is an issue around something, you know, then I just wouldn't want to use something that I that I shouldn't I don't, be using. I don't think there would be, to be honest. Okay. But yeah, sure, I'll send you some. No problem. Okay. Uh, okay. And then this will come out next week, Thursday. Okay. Cool. Yeah, Thank I'll you. Keep, I'll give it a listen. Yeah, I'll keep you in the loop. What I'll most probably do is just send you all the artwork, all of that sort of stuff ahead of time for you to just give me a thumbs up or pop it to you on WhatsApp. No stress. Um, yeah. Thank you for your cool. time. That was really cool. Awesome. Thanks, Vian. Right. Cheers, keep working. Eh? Keep you. working. Always, always. Yeah. It's always cool. a process. Thank you. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye.